Welcome, everyone. We're here to talk about digitization in the MENA region, some of the challenges and stumbling blocks, but also some of the opportunities that it presents. And we're also here to talk about the uh, policy proposal that you created to accompany that process of digitization in the region, and also to talk about some of the societal and political challenges that accompany digitization in the region. So very happy to have you all here. And we have Daniel Gerlach with us, an author, journalist, political analyst. Uh, you're the editor-in-chief of Zenith Magazine and director of the Candid Foundation. Daniel. Professor Dr. Ayad Al-Ani is a professor for change management and consulting, an associated member of the Einstein Center Digital Future, focusing on digital transformation and accompanying transformation in society. Welcome. Hello. And last but not least, Ines Amri, a researcher at the Einstein Center as well, focusing on platform economies in the Maghreb region. Uh, you're also a doctoral candidate at the ch Chair of Trust in Digital Services at the TU Berlin. Welcome, all three of you. We keep using the word digitization, and we hear it a lot as a buzzword in politics as well. So I just want to start with a quick round of what that means to you. So Ines, maybe you can start. What does digitization mean to you? Um, I mean, it's a process of, uh, you know, it's a whole transformational journey process of uh, including um, uh, using digital processes, digital businesses, um, in, in including uh, digital processes in, in businesses, in governments, in society, in culture, just making use of, uh, of technology uh, in all spheres and areas. So that's a very simple, um, let's say, definition. Yeah. Do you agree? Absolutely. I think uh, on taking this definition further, I think on a practical level, it could mean that you basically substitute uh, physical work with uh, process automation and you substitute human decision making with artificial intelligence. So these are two very, very practical uh, kind of effects of, of digitization. Daniel, what's your take on it? Well, I, of course, I have a different perspective on it. I'm, I don't have a background in, in management, uh, neither in uh, engineering. And for me, of course, my association with the term digitization is um, what, um, what the other two just uh, mentioned means for the societies. The transformation, the transformation process that, that societies, states, and, uh, and uh, individuals are going through. And this is also the reason why I took particular interest in this field and why we have started working on the project that we are uh, about to discuss. If you look at the state of digitization in the MENA region right now, where do things stand? Look, I, I, I cannot, uh, I don't have any authority to, to discuss this, of course, from a, from a technical perspective. But um, I see that uh, we as Europeans, as, as Germans in particular, don't have necessarily the, 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 the right answers to the question, where does digitization stand? Because uh, I think we are lacking behind. And therefore, I think we can also uh, deal with the Middle East, deal with the Arab world, with the so-called MENA region on some sort of an equal footing. Mm -hmm. Because we are about to learn uh, the digital process has been initiated and it's, going, it's happening, it's already happening. But uh, to what extent are we making good use of it? To what extent uh, can we cooperate on this? Uh, this is the, the, the most important question for me. I think there is a, a lot of appetite for it and there is a lot of appetite for the knowledge about the process, process of digitization, but where it actually stands, probably Ayad is more qualified to answer this question. I think there is a very peculiar uh, um, uh, thing to notice concerning digitization in the Arab world, and, and this is the, 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 the notion that uh, in the Arab nations digitization had been perceived initially as something very, very new that is working alongside the traditional sectors. So at, at the beginning it was, a, it was a new, it was an exciting, it was an innovative thing, but the idea behind it was we can do that, uh, but the, the, the other institutions, political institutions, economic institutions remain as they are. Mm -hmm. And this is of course not working. <laughs> and uh, and um, however I must say that in the past two years there has been uh, a, a really a, an explosion also in the discussions uh, in the in the Arab world concerning digitization, and uh, of course it has been uh, focusing very very much on the on the economic side of it, 
uh, it, it has not been focusing very much on how to transform the traditional economy into a, into a new one. It has focused very much on things like startups and tech hubs and things like that, and it and it has also not focused very much on the political side of of uh, digital transformation. So it is perceived as. A, a kind of isolated phenomena that is taking place somewhere, but it's hopefully, hopefully not affecting the traditional way of, of uh, living. And that, of course, we all know that's, that's, an, that's an illusion. Yeah. Why do you think we're seeing this explosion now, that it's now reaching that, that point of discourse? Uh, there had been uh, a discourse, for instance, in countries like, like Germany that started, I would say, six, seven years ago, where, uh, where sophisticated economies were worrying about the disruptive effects of digitization. And of course, 90% uh, of the jobs are in the traditional sector. So especially countries like Germany, or also France, had been trying to figure out, you know, what will happen to our workforce? What, what will happen also to, to the society contract if, if, uh, if we don't have this, this amount and this quality of work any, any longer, if we have different quality of work, for instance? Uh, and so it took some time for this discussion also to, to reach the Arab world, because uh, I think right now everybody knows that uh, the, the current institutions are in dire need of some kind of um, some kind of transformation, of some kind of development, positive development. And perhaps there is the assumption now that technology might be a, a very neutral kind of tool in, in doing that. And perhaps he also the, the Chinese model is, is a very uh, interesting because they, they also have the same assumption. You know, we can use technology to build a new society. Hopefully this new society will not evoke too many power changes. Uh, which of course is an, is a, I, I would say it's an, uh, uh, it will not work at the end of the day, but maybe it can buy some time. I think when we discuss digitalization in the Arab world or in the MENA region, it, I mean, it should, we should uh, understand that there is an e uneven distribution of, 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 let's say, of maturity or understanding. Um, uh, Arabs, let's say, ten years ago, they leveraged the use of, uh, you know, of uh, technology through social media to change some regimes, as we know, uh, you know, to 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 use blogs, blogs and and social media to to advocate for certain rights. Um, so it was more for political change, political rights in some uh, Arab countries. Now, I think more and more, as Professor Alayani said, now um, more and more in the last couple of years, we see. A lot of changes in, on the scene of startups, uh, lots of new trends. Um, but also, I think it's the need of young people, uh, you know, to to um, to be in the sphere of, of digital economy. Um, and and um, in in uh, Tunisia, for example, we uh, we see uh, lots of outsourcing. Um, Tunisia, Egypt, and Turkey are leading outsourcing uh, trends uh, with thousands and thousands of engineers and software developers. Um, there, there are also gaming uh, uh, economy. Um, there are also uh, other trends related to e-commerce. So it's a dynamic e-commerce. Um, um, the, it's stagnating a bit, but the, the, the dynamics are happening very slow. And I think the need now is the need to have governments react immediately um, so that they can meet the expectations of, of youth. And uh, digitalization cannot be, um, you know, analyzed uh, on its own side. Like, we need to also think of demographic changes. You know, we have a youth bulge, we have... Um, you know, by 2050, the World Bank says that we will be, uh, there will be a need of 300 million jobs for young people. Uh, mostly 45% uh, of the population will be young. So I think technology can be used as a leverage, you know, to create jobs. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, so this is a big opportunity in the MENA region. But again, the, 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 the issue is how can we get governments, uh, you know, react Im immediately? Um, no, uh, I, I don't know who I'm uh, quoting or misquoting, uh, but I like this, uh, this term, uh, this phrase very much. Technology is the answer, but what's the question? Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I think, a mentality that we're facing, that we've been facing in our work. And to uh, ask the right question, 
is what I think brought us also together. Because um, everyone would agree, like, you know, te technology will make our lives easier and te technology will help us to address certain, uh, certain problems, big problems also, uh, of communities, of states, of societies, of the entire region. Um, but um, we are trying to ask the questions for it. We are, we are trying to, to ask, um, in what way does technological transformation change, impact the societies that we are dealing with? And the impact is not necessarily positive, uh, in my view, and also uh, in the view of uh, many people that we have talked to, that we have interviewed in the last couple of months. Um, there's also fear of this digital transformation. There is fear that this digital transformation might end up the wrong way or in the wrong hands, that it might deepen the gaps, the rifts within society, uh, that it might, uh, we will discuss that probably more in detail later, but uh, that it will create monopolies, um, that it will become a tool of oppression rather than a tool of, uh, to promote diversity and equal chances. Uh, that it's not going to be for the benefit of the societies. And uh, this is, of course, like all technolo technological innovation in, in history, and history is, I'd say, rather my field of expertise, uh, has been used for warfare. It has been used uh, to make, uh, to make uh, the life and the livelihood of people, or to secure the life and livelihood of people, but it also uh, ended up in the wrong hands, quite literally. And uh, yeah, so... But I think what, what, what can be said uh, with some certainty is that there currently in the Arab world there is little discussion about how a future society should, should look like. Mm -hmm. I mean, even here in Europe, there, there are, there are li limitations because uh, most of us uh, are are uh, missing the imagination <laughs> of, of, uh, on, on how to pro project uh, how a society can, could look like that, that, is using, uh, that, that is using digital means. I mean, there is a, there's the Chinese model on one side, which is perceived as being uh, very authoritarian, using technology to enforce uh, certain power structures. Uh, then there is there is Europe, which tries to regulate the technology, and mm. <laughs> so, so, it, so it can serve the uh, society uh, on, and, it, and it could serve and it can serve the uh, the democratic model uh, then the, the downside of course of the of the European model is that it doesn't process the technologies so it has to work together with China and the US mm -hmm. on, on on assimilating uh, and appropriating those those <laughs> technologies so in a, in a in a way and that's I think very interesting is that that Europe and the Arab world, are in the same boat, so, so to say. I think that that was also a conclusion that reached so many problems that, for instance, Germany is facing because Germany doesn't have huge uh, economic platforms, global, global platforms. Uh, um, this is a similar situation in the Arab world. Uh, the Arab world doesn't have uh, regional or, of course, not, not, or no international platforms which can promote trade and commerce and technology. There, were, there are only two, but they are sold. They are, they are, they are, they yeah. are but they, are, they were sold to the to, to US to, to US yeah. companies. Yeah. So in a sense, in a sense, uh, uh, the Arab world and, and and Europe have very similar pro problems, and uh, so we, we we thought that a a transfer of the discussion or perhaps even the mutual discussions be between the two regions could be very beneficial because they are dealing with the same partners. It's a very powerful Chinese and American players, and are trying. And, and both both regions are trying to figure out, you know, how can we adapt those this technology? How can we work together with those companies so so that we can we can have a society model that is that is working for us? And of course, keeping some of some of the jobs. Huh? And let's not forget uh, the Arab world, and that might sound astonishing to many, uh, because the Arab world is not in, generally not known for for being technologically or economically particularly progressive hmm. but or leading um, but uh, it's a huge cultural space which has uh, a common denominator which is the Arabic language um, and in order like we see very little regional integration very little regional cooperation or, or cooperation between the countries of the Arab world fragmented spaces in the way mostly looking towards Europe and towards like trade agreements or whatever with with uh, uh, more industrialized countries but in fact this huge cultural space, this like this feeling of somehow belonging together, that was that was also strengthened by the Arab Spring, um, is I think something that we should uh, keep in mind and uh, see the, ch the 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 chances and the opportunities here. The future is of course very much shaped by the way we talk about the future, and um, 
this is what I enjoyed very much in the work of the last couple of months, working with people from different uh, crafts and different fields of expertise. This is what we at Candid Foundation try to do, bring people together from different disciplines and, and, and make it like uh, mutually beneficial and the exchange of, 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 of knowledge. And uh, I like very much to discuss these issues, not with fellow historians or journalists or political scientists, but with, with economists or, 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 or so-called techies, because very often they have a very different, very very pragmatic, very forward-looking uh, uh, perspective on the region, and not the usual, it's all like this nostalgia that we very often hear from, from people who write books about the region, say like it's, the, the region has seen better days and it's all going towards chaos and mass uncontrolled mass migration and authoritarianism and, and, you, ha and you name it. So um, this is why I think the interdisciplinary approach uh, is, it can be a very useful one. So we've heard that it takes an interdisciplinary approach. And Inez, I want to ask you, we also heard from Ayad that, you know, just now in the MENA region, people are starting to talk about the effect of technology. Uh, and while, you know, here in Europe, that discussion is also taking place about how should we shape technology and how can that shape our future? Who needs to be part of that discussion when it comes to the MENA region? A very good question. I think everyone should be uh, at the table uh, discussing, uh, you know, the future and the present. Uh, but of course, um, I think I like the way Germany, uh, Angela Merkel started the, the process is through crowdsourcing policies. Uh, like two years ago, I think there was a crowdsourcing about the use of AI. And uh, the, uh, there were many um, contributions from many experts in AI and, and society, societal change. So. I think as a first step, uh, of course, there should be a collaborative approach. Um, um, we need communication, uh, um, you know, like reciprocal communication uh, between Europe, between the US, between different parts, but also, of course, people in the Arab world. Um, uh, experts, of course, should be, uh, sit, should be on, uh, sitting at the table. Um, uh, economists, policymakers, because I think the 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 main catalyst for uh, any transformational change, um, any digital transformation in the MENA region uh, will be carried out by uh, policymakers. There, it, there, there is a. There's a lot of things uh, we, we need to change, like uh, legal frameworks, uh, legislative uh, you know, measures. Uh, we can learn a lot. I mean, as a Tunisian, as I identify as an Arab woman, I think we can learn a lot uh, from, uh, from uh, Europe, uh, because Europe has been, uh, um, let's say, in ad advanced in this uh, data privacy uh, legal framework, uh, you know, the GDPR. So I think. Um, it, th there should be a flow of communication between the, the Europe and, um, and and the South, let's say, Arab countries, um, and uh, experts, economists, uh, civil society, and tech people, young people, disruptors, uh, because I, I think they need to be heard often. They need to be, uh, you know, present. Young people, women need to be, you know. To, to be there drafting and designing the, the future. You know, one of the, unfortunately, because if we continue like this, the, um, the, 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 there will be a big uh, risk of uh, immigration flux and brain, uh, brain drain. Um, people, I mean, the, the current wave of immigration now is not for political reasons, maybe, or for, you know, economic reasons. The people who are leaving uh, Arab countries, they have jobs in their countries. They used to have jobs and they are well paid, but m most of them, they are leaving because of the quality of life. Um, I can relate. I mean, personally, I give a personal anecdote just uh, for everyone to, to understand the, the, you know, uh, one of the reasons I had to, um, I had to leave uh, Tunisia, unfortunately, was the fact that I felt in a prison, financial prison. And this is one of the issues, that, that's why I'm saying policymakers should be at the forefront, understanding the, the real issues. Um, you know, as a Tunisian traveling every month, I didn't, I, I don't have the right to carry uh, foreign exchange, like foreign currencies, uh, and we have uh, 
let's say, only around 2,000 euros to spend per year. This is actually a big problem for platform economies and digital economy. Um, and one of the reasons I really wanted to leave, because I'm not using technology, I'm not using digital payment solutions, you know, that they are making my life easier. And I, and I think there are thousands of people now leaving just because life, modern life is difficult already and we don't have much time. So we want to use technology to make our life easier. And that's, the, I think, the, the main role of uh, technology now, to make our lives more accessible, more easy and quicker. Yeah. Keyword access. You know, not everyone in the MENA region has access to digital technologies. How much of a limitation is that? Oh, I, I would say one of the positive aspects of digitization is that for the first time in the, in the history of the Arab world, uh, many people do have access to, to not only technology, but also to, to content, to, to learning content, for instance, to, to information. So I guess uh, the, one of the huge problems that we had in the Arab world, like, 20 years ago was that there was limited flow of, of information. There was, there was limited access to, to, to learning. That was only possible through the official channels. Uh, and I think this has, this has changed. And uh, I think this is a positive aspect of it. So we can see that right now there are lots of people, for, lots of individuals in the Arab world who, who acquired those technologies and they're trying to to develop their ideas, implement their, their ideas, building startups, the, the, trying to do projects. Um, when we did a survey in, the, in some, most of the Arab countries, we found that there are really high class solutions in some countries. We have people in, in, in Morocco that, that are working uh, on, on uh, how to digitize the, the, the public sphere. We have specialists in, in Lebanon that are dealing with, with fake news. Uh, we have specialists and, and successful entrepreneurs in, in Jordan uh, doing uh, things like uh, fintechs and, and, and also uh, um, digital learning. So there are those success stories, but those individuals right now, they are pretty much isolated. <laughs> and I think this is, this is a, a difference between uh, between Europe and the Arab world in that regard. So if, if, you, if you are successful as a digital entrepreneur in the Arab world, you are very, very good. You're probably better <laughs> than your colleagues here in Germany because you have... It's more difficult to it's, it's more difficult. You have managed all those obstacles. Uh, one of the, however, one of the strategies that, that you had been using by now was to isolate yourself also because you don't want to be attached to people that can impact you on the negative side. So I think one of the, one of the aspects we, we have to work on, and, and that's also should be part of our idea is, and how can we connect the, how can we connect the dots? You know, how can we, can we uh, build safe spaces or exchange platforms, however yeah. you want to call it, where people can exchange their, their ideas and help each other. Because right now, as, as Daniel mentioned before, especially in the, in the Maghreb countries, it appeared to me that there is a strong focus on Europe. Uh, there is a, a not so strong focus on other African countries, but there is almost no exchange among Arab countries. Mm -hmm. That has to do with the, with the political difficulties these countries are having. And uh, so this is, this is really a pity. And, and how can we use the, the Arab sphere, so to say? Is there, is there a digital dimension to the Arab world? And I think this, this, could, be, this could be part of a solution. Um, I wanted to comment on the success stories. Um, of course, everyone knows the, the fact that many Arabs somehow a bit also ironically are referring to the Syrian origins of uh, Steve Jobs. Um, but in fact... We are proud. But of course, you're proud. <laughs> you, uh, but uh, even as Tunisians, you're proud of, of the Syrian origins yeah. of, of Steve Jobs. But um, the success, success stories are, are important for the, for the narrative because they show in a, in, a, in a certain way not only that, uh, that it is possible to, to, through certain drivers of innovation to, to, to change the mindset, but um, it also, I think, uh, helps us to better connect to the region. Um, I find it, of course, difficult to, to assess the quality of the technological innovation that startup entrepreneurs or young tech people in the region uh, do achieve. But... I see them as, 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 as important drivers of civil society. I think very often, you know, for over the last 10 years, I have participated in many conferences and events about 
um, economic innovation and how to provide uh, jobs and dignity and, and livelihood to people in the region. And then very often, <clears throat> here come the startup entrepreneurs. They're taken to Davos and to international conferences, to the European Commission, and we have done that also, by the way. And uh, here are the young, talented, smart, uh, innovative people that don't give up. Of course, it's wrong to put all this, these expectations on, 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 on entrepreneurs in the region. It's also wrong to expect them, you should succeed, but you should stay where you are. You should not, no brain drain. We don't want you in Europe, you should stay there where you are and you should take, you know, assume the responsibility of developing your, your, your society and your country. That is too much uh, to ask from, 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 from innovative people. They, of course, want to, uh, they, they, they want to succeed wherever they succeed and they are of course flexible and they are of course also cosmopolitan in a way. But um, nevertheless, I think the, the startup entrepreneurs and, and, and young drivers of, of, of digital transformation can be valuable uh, for the civil society and they, because they can change the, the mindset and they can change also the way that society communicates with governments and the, the private sector because they find practical solutions to sometimes very theoretical answers. So what is the best uh, sorry, way to uh, questions? What is the best way to support them then? If you look at this from a perspective of a European stakeholder and you're saying it's too much to ask to have them carry the burden of solving cultural participation in, in their societies. What is the support that is needed then? Well, look, I, I don't have the answer to that yet. I don't want to claim uh, uh, that I have the answer to this. But, uh, but of course, the, the, the ideas that we are bringing forward, the, the policy recommendations uh, in the field of education, of course, and, and, and cooperation in education on, on specifically on digitization could be one uh, contribution to it. Um, of course, like there is a, a there's a lot of discussions going on, and we will not be able to answer the, these questions if economic liberal, liberaliza, liberal, liberalization, uh, imposing uh, liberal uh, uh, like uh, reform agendas on the countries of the region are the uh, are the, the the remedy that the doctor prescribes. But um, that is a different uh, story. We want to address a very specific question with some very practical. Proposals. However, I think uh, the trend you described as neoliberalism, I think we can already see that it's already reversing. Mm. And that has to do with the policies implemented by uh, President Trump, for instance. So it turns out that it makes sense also to protect some, somehow your, your society and your economy. So that's uh, for uh, astonishing enough, that's a discussion we had in the 70s or, or 80s that is resurfacing now. But I think what, what I want to add to what Daniel said is, uh, I think we still don't have the precise answer on who should be doing what during during digitization. However, I think it's safe to assume that it must be some kind of interplay between the, the new forces, mainly being the young people that are now in this in this new uh, digital sector, let's call it that way. Uh, there must be, however, some kind of connection and interplay with the traditional uh, uh, industries and the traditional services of a society, so they must they must somehow learn from each other. That is also something that had been implemented here in Germany for some time, where where huge companies are inviting uh, young young people to help them re-innovate their their business model. And last but not least, I think uh, the, the the public sector also has an important role to play. And uh, it's not it's not an it's not an easy role because it's. Uh, uh, it, it has two different roles that the state must be assuming. So on one side, uh, it's a very decentralized model that, that is very uh, supportive to innovation. So the more voices you have, the better it is for innovation. When you start to implement the innovation, <laughs> And uh, that's very costly, that's depending on, on expensive technology, then it's good to have one or two major investors that, that are collecting the ideas and helping the, helping the implementation process. So on one side, it's a very decentralized model that we're thinking of, and on the other side, it's a very collaborative, uh, it's a, col a very collaborative model. So you don't, you're not going to invent uh, uh, machine learning in Tunisia in ten different places, but maybe on two or three, and that and that must be that must be somehow probably supported by the state. So it's also a new role for for everybody involved, not only the the young entrepreneurs, but it's also the state and it's also the traditional economy. 
So Ayed and Daniel, you talked about some of the challenges with digitization, and you came up with a specific policy proposal, uh, the MENA Digital School. Tell us what this is. Well, of course, MENA Digital School is a working title. Um, but we want to come forward with an idea how to address the lack of experts in digitization. Um, it's very, like, my, my uh, experience is that it's whenever I talk to people from different segments and different fields of expertise, they would tell me that uh, the research on, on digitization or the expertise on digitization is rather fragmented. People look at it from an economic, from a technological, uh, sometimes from a social or, or media-related uh, perspective. But uh, we think it's important to have interdisciplinary experts in this field, people who understand the phenomena and the approaches and the solutions, the impact, and also help to direct digitization in to, 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 to the right direction and to uh, um, help implement it for the benefit of society, for a, the benefit of a pluralistic, uh, diverse, uh, progressive society. And uh, so we think one way to address this, uh, of course, this lack of experts is to produce experts by training them, by establishing an academic institution, to what extent it has to be academic, a university, uh, a school in the broader sense. That is, of course, something that we've also been discussing with many experts uh, in this project. But uh, we think that uh, some sort of uh, uh, a, a, an institution should be built in the virtual or in the physical space to train people in this particular field, to produce experts on digitization. And who is the target audience here for the school? Um, since Ayat has more experience in building universities and schools <laughs> and developing <laughs> curricula, he can probably, he's more qualified so, to answer this question. Yeah, so, so what we did in the past weeks is we, we entered into interviews with, with many experts uh, from within the region, but also from, from outside the region, trying to, to figure out you know, what, what could really be the target group or who should be, who sh who should, whom, whom should we develop this, this uh, learning content for. And um, the, I think the, the uh, answer is that we get uh, uh, a feedback that goes into the direction that we should focus on management as well. So uh, some people are telling us that uh, it's not so much the lack of technology skills, especially among the younger people that, that is the issue, but it's people who are in charge of the transformation process. Uh, middle management, senior management, who should be who have, or on the other hand, who have very little idea on how this technology will affect their institutions, uh, but uh, should be in charge of, of doing that. So uh, it's uh, it's more going in the direction of, of uh, professionals, young young professionals, also senior professionals. Uh, but we we also get uh, we also get the feedback that even the younger people, the the, the young graduates, are uh, lacking some of the skills that that Daniel, <coughs> sorry, that, that Daniel laid, laid out. They, they might have some technology skills, but uh, what we're looking for are, are management skills also that that help you uh, to assimilate the te technology and put it into the context of your situation. That that also requires some kind of political uh, or a social science view, it also requires uh, an understanding of the, of the legal framework you are operating in. So it's a much more diverse uh, kind of knowledge that is required here that is currently, that is currently, that's our assumption, that is currently provided by, by local or even international universities in this, in this area. And uh, with regard to the target group, that was a very interesting, very hot topic we discussed. And of course, there was a wide range of opinions about it. To what extent uh, do we also need to reach out to people who work in public administration? Mm. Um, these are not the conventional target group for uh, universities, uh, universities that want to provide, offer MBAs, uh, for example. Because, of course, if you, have a, if you have a career, if you already have a job in public administration, um, it is not the most normal thing to leave uh, your job for a couple of months or a year or frequently in order to, ad, uh, to attend uh, courses on digitization. But on the other hand, we think uh, it is very important because this is where, where a lot of leverage is. Um, we discussed earlier that uh, the governments, the states, the administration need to, need to be on board 
to uh, implement a successful and uh, successful and progressive digital transformation. And if they have no knowledge and no understanding of how this works, why would they care to 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 support it? Um, and this, therefore, this is it, it, it's not undecided. You know, we're very open about about all, all our business secrets because we know it's so immensely difficult <laughs> to make such a thing work that we are not that we're very very transparent. Uh, our information about this is of course uh, is of course Creative Commons, um, and so are the results of the conversations that we had. Um, to what extent do the governments really uh, need, uh, or do, do we have to see the the governments as drivers of the digital transformation? I cannot really answer this, but the feedback that I have gotten from, uh, from, for example, a, a re recently a German member of parliament who cares very much about the subject, he said, if you want to understand digitization and if you want to get expertise on this, you shouldn't go to the top government level. You should look at the local administration, like uh, municipalities. This is where a lot of digital transformation is happening because they, of course, they are, they are the ones that are in touch with, with the people. They are the ones that need to provide public services to the people. And so for them, when we talk about digital governance or digital administration, of course, this is where a lot of trial and error uh, is happening. And this is uh, what we can benefit from. And certainly, this is something that the MENA region also could benefit from. And define for us which countries you're involving in the MENA region here. Which countries are you targeting with this? Initiative. Of course, this is also a, a, a very difficult question. We assessed, we looked at the, at, at the individual countries and at the situation there, at the needs, and of, of course, at the, to what extent uh, such, an, such an institution would be attractive. Of course, uh, the Gulf states are, to a certain extent, advanced, more advanced when it comes to, to, to uh, the resources that are put in, uh, the training that exists, but only for a very specific part of the digitization or the digital transformation. A lot of what's happening in the Gulf states is, of course, is going into a direction that we don't think uh, digital transformation should go to, namely the, author, the, the application or the use of, of digitization uh, at the service of authoritarian power. But nevertheless, uh, the Gulf states are an interesting model to look at. Um, but we think that uh, countries like Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Egypt, potentially Sudan, are uh, a very interesting uh, fields to study where, this, this, uh, where, 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 where digital transformation and the way we look at it can have a lot of leverage, uh, can do uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of good also. And um, there is also another aspect that I wanted to mention, which is if we only look at the uh, at manufacturing and the ind industrial world, uh, of course, a lot of uh, low-wage jobs uh, in this region are going to uh, be eliminated by uh, artificial intelligence or robotic uh, robotic uh, production. I don't know if that's the accurate term, but I'm using it now. Uh, and this means that, that, that people that work in the low-wage sector, and a lot of women, if we look at Tunisia, are working in this sector, are working in, the, in, the, uh, in this uh, kind of industry. Uh, for example, spare parts for the car for the European car industry are being produced in Morocco and Tunisia, and in this field, of course, a lot of women will also be affected negatively affected by the digital transformation of industries. And therefore, we think uh, these are interesting countries to look at because they don't have too many too much natural resources. They have no oil wealth and not so much capital to invest. And uh, knowledge, um, as you said, talent is their prime resource, and that needs to be stimulated. So the digital school will also then, in a way, address some of the issues of gender parity in the region, is that right? I think we need to be very, very open about it because, uh, as, as Daniel said, it's not only technology involved and technology is rather neutral and depends on how you use it. Uh, what, what became clear to us during the interviews is that most of the people said, you know, what, whatever you do, whatever learning content you produce, you must try to put it in an Arab context. And I think this could be the, the, uh, the very important, uh, unique selling proposition of such kind of, uh, of a learning platform. Uh, because right now, there are no case studies of, uh, of how digitization will be implemented in the Arab world. It, it is a very distinct kind of, of environment. It has certain, certain rules, it, it has certain functionalities, and if you don't understand them, and, and if, you, if you don't integrate them into your strategy, then, then you're doomed to fail. So we don't want to, of course, uh, uh, 
make the learning content less less dis disruptive, but we, we we must make it more suitable for for the Arab world. And right now, that that that, that is not happening. That's also the feedback we got from when we talk to people from the Gulf that there are a lot of prestigious universities there already, but they are they are teaching the the Western uh, kind of content, which can be applicable, but only limitedly so. So it can break through some of the barriers. Do you think this is the right tool to do so? To involve more and to have such local a content. Yeah, Lo yeah. Of course, I think it's uh, it's good to to learn from international case studies. Um, as you know, the field is new, and there are lots of uh, shared learnings and lots of international case studies. But I think it's very important to uh, yeah create uh, local uh, tailored programs. You know, with uh, concrete projects. Um, from the field uh, to make the learnings more impactful and more effective. Well, in order to create the proposal that you did, you conducted a lot of research. And let's hear more about that research now. We can speak to Leo Viga, who is a project manager for the Mina DS proposal. And Leo, tell us more about the concrete findings. Thank you, Sumi. In order to find out more about the needs and demands for digital transformation know-how in the MENA region, we reached out and conducted more than 35 interviews with key stakeholders from the region and beyond. And this is what we found out. The first key finding is that there's still a mismatch between demands for digital transformation know-how and the current offerings in the region. In the next step, we looked at the potential structure of the MENA Digital School and the results were quite close all answers between four and five. Combination of traditional and digital content delivery, a hybrid model of teaching, was identified as the most important. Lastly, we looked at the potential curricula and subjects being taught at the MENA Digital School. And management skills, including all leadership skills, was ranked highest. Somewhat surprisingly, maybe, or maybe not, um, but technical skills and political and social services, as well as legal matters, came behind management skills. I'm looking forward to hear what you made out of these findings. Back to you, back to the studio. Thank you, Leo Viga, the project manager for the MENA Digital School. What do you think of those findings? It's pretty interesting. Um, yes, of course, uh, they get less and less surprising when you are yourself part of the of the research team. But um, when we look at the, 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 the priorities, let's say, the priorities of uh, the fields, the priorities of the disciplines, of the content, um, I totally understand that people think management is the most important. Uh, but I also find it interesting that uh, social, political skills and legal skills uh, are also have been, have been considered very important like much less technical skills, um, in my view. It was much less surprising that people find this relevant. Of course, we, we, we're having this discussion. Uh, would it make, practically, would it make sense for a, um, uh, an economist who wants to study the impact of digital transformation or be part of it, to what, to, to what extent does this person need to learn coding or have like engineering skills? Um, because maybe at a certain age, uh, at a certain also level of seniority, you don't have the patience to sit down and, uh, and, 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 and study coding or whatever other technical skills can be taught. On the other hand, we thought, okay, if you study medicine, of course you're taking classes in anatomy, you're taking classes in, uh, in uh, physiology, in chemistry. Um, maybe you're never ever in your life as a doctor going to uh, work on chemical formulas, but you need to understand the basics. You need to have a, a, a basic understanding about the matter that you're dealing with. And uh, therefore we think that this uh, interdisciplinary approach is really valuable, it's very useful and also reflects adequately the, the phenomenon of digitization because it, it happens, as I said before, in, in, in many different fields and it affects different fields. Uh, we did not ask people uh, to what extent media should be taught. Um, of course, media is social, social political, it, it, it is technical, and it is also legal to a large extent. Um, but we've had the input also from some of the participants, some of the experts, that we should include journalists. 
we should include media practitioners into the target group because they are such a relevant uh, uh, driver of, uh, of the public sphere and of transformation in the public sphere. And they are also heavily impacted by digitization. And at the same time, the digital change that is happening in the media sphere has a strong impact again on politics, state society and the economy. I just wanted to add that I think the technical side is good to have or to know, get the basics. But what's most important is to foster the strategic thinking. Uh, um, but also it's good to know what's AI, blockchain, you know, all of these uh, technical uh, technologies. Because I think as a manager or as a, let's say, a policymaker, you need to also to understand the mindset and the culture of uh, technologists, people who work in technology. You cannot manage them, you cannot lead them, uh, you know, be at the forefront and understand them and, and take, uh, you know, um, and, and take them where you want if you also don't understand the culture, um, you know, of, of work. So it's good to have, but I think mostly it's, it's um, management skills, um, uh, psychology, uh, also skills are very important. The uh, instilling the minds, the creativity, instilling uh, critical thinking um, are very important skills to foster in the Arab region and much needed as, as well. Aya, you were of course a part of the research of the many conversations, as you said, that you've had over the last few months. How did those findings play into the type of digital school and platform that you created? <laughs> Well, in many ways, it's not, it's not only that we, that we talked about the, the possible content that, that, that should be de delivered. And I think that, that that was a very intensive debate and this, the debate is still going on. You know, how, how practical should it be? Uh, what, what types of, of, uh, of content should it include? I guess our conclusion was that it should, uh, re regardless of the theoretical possibilities that are, that are offered in those fields, it should be very, very practical. It should help people transforming the institutions they are working in. It should help people create the ideas they, they are having. So it should be, in a sense, practical. It should have an Arab context. It should, it should play into that. Uh, and I think the, the other surprising feedback we got is that we shouldn't replicate existing mm -hmm. school models because they they already existing. There there is an there is a huge influx of, of Western universities, especially into the Arab Gulf countries, but also in North North Africa. There's a huge variety of, of offerings there, and we shouldn't replicate them. Uh, and uh, I, I would say I, I would fully I would fully agree to that because we cannot teach a disruptive kind of science and then ad adhere to a, tra a, tra a traditional uh, service delivery model. So we should more so be innovative uh, first amongst ourselves and create a model that is le leveraging local content, connecting them with, with uh, uh, Western content and is choosing uh, a, new, a new way of, transfer of, of transferring this, this know-how. So I think uh, this, is, this is the burden we are having. So we must be uh, uh, designed or we, we must be in the position to design a very innovative school model first. And, and then if, if, that is, this, if that works, then the, the, the rest will work as well. And when we talk about digital school, by the way, that was also, I think it's important to address this in the terminology. We're not talking about uh, something that's, that's happening on Zoom, right? So digital school doesn't mean that, that, that the, 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 the instruments that I use to teach are digital. Of course, that's part of it, and that was also part of the discussion to what, it, to what extent we, have, we should have traditional and digital means of content delivery. Uh, but we think that this is, uh, it's very relevant to also have face-to-face, -face, uh, to have interaction, to, have, uh, to build a community, to build alumni, to have people really work cooperatively together. And then uh, one uh, participant who is a, a, a formerly high-ranking diplomat from the Maghreb, uh, he said, if you only do digital content delivery, you might think that it's more equal because people can access it from all over the world. But the opposite might be true. You, don't, you have very different uh, conditions, learning and living conditions in the countries. Uh, and that pertains to internet connection, bandwidth. Uh, do you have your own room, your own house to study? And so we think it is important to bring people and also, of course, the, the human rights situation and uh, what you mentioned, the financial prison that you have escaped from. Um, 
You know, there are so many, so different, so many factors that influence uh, the career of a person and the way that a person, to what to what extent a person can 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 learn and understand and benefit from it. That we think it would really make sense to bring people together. Well, um, I think, um, if if I may add to that, uh, and here perhaps uh, the COVID situation is somehow playing into our hands mm -hmm. to some. Yes. If I'm if I'm Definitely. allowed to say that uh, in this. In this, in this terrible context, uh, because uh, of course Daniel is, is right saying that we, we need some kind of balanced model between de delivering uh, content uh, on via digital means and also have, have some important portions in a face-to-face -face kind of situation. Uh, I think nobody will expect that after COVID we will all re return to face-to-face -to -face learning. 100%. No, it, it, it will not happen. Uh, and uh, we, we also learned that during the Arab world, there is a in, in, in the Arab world, there is a in some countries a strong reluctancy towards digital learning. Uh, in some countries, it's not it's not even allowed to to have a digital means for your for your for your, uh, for, your, uh, for your diploma, which is absolutely nonsense. But nevertheless, I think what is what is helping us in the situation is that the. Uh, education sector is is under transformation in any case, and we can we can we can build on that. We can use on that. And as Dana said, we need to find the right balance be between the method. It's a, it's it will be hybrid. It will be hybrid between uh, content that that we can deliver uh, via digital means, and and there will be sections that will that will be very practical, having to do with project work and also meeting and dis discussing your work with other people. So it, it will have all those kind of situations on your on your learning path. We reached out to a bunch of stakeholders and experts to hear what they had to say about this project. Here's their feedback. New work needs new learning. That's why the innovative approaches of MENA Digital School are so important. Only by learning about the deeper dimensions of digitalizations, we will turn that into a success model for our societies, economically, ecologically, and personally. Many people in the MENA region are much more at home in virtual realities than we Europeans are. Young people in particular want to do everything digitally, but they lack the know-how. A lot of things run intuitively. Two groups should be particularly targeted. One, the public sector, which has the leverage to impact profound change. Civil servants who have a holistic understanding can streamline digital transformation. And two, people in rural areas and refugees who do not have the same access to the digital space and are therefore disconnected from the world around them. When it comes to e-learning, content means everything. If e-learning content is not masterfully designed, all the rest will just go down the drain. So I think technical skills are actually sufficiently covered, um, but there is still a major gap between the link. So in the link between these technical skills and the ethical, social and political part. Um, there is also a major gap in terms of uh, what the technical um, implications are in terms of uh, enterprise strategy, uh, priorities, business model, uh, positioning um, and how it be, should be serving the market. Personal meetings are of great importance to build trust, especially in and with the Middle East and North Africa region. Therefore, I would suggest to choose not just solely digital formats of approach to teaching, but to be flexible. The whole approach of the MENA Digital School is very relevant at this moment. I think it fills an existing gap and it will be extremely attractive for the students and it will be also easy to scale up. Ayad and Daniel, tell us a bit more about the nuts and bolts of what you're offering with this digital school and this platform. Well, as, as mentioned before, we, we assume now that it has to be very practical. So it will start with a, with a project that the, that the student uh, uh, has, in, has in mind. So the student will probably have this project in mind and will apply with this project idea at this at the school and then what happens is that we will try to offer a very personalized learning path so we will try to to uh, de deliver content that is very closely 
connected to the to the project that this person is having. This project could be could be anything. It could be a startup. It could be a transformation of a of a traditional institution. It could be a policy. Also, it could be a strategy. So it could be a very wide array of ideas and imaginations that this person is having. And we will build the curriculum around this around this idea, so it will be highly personalized. And we will try to connect this person then also to a to a community that, that is also supportive in, in his or her situation. So we are we are in the midst of a process of, of building a database of uh, of uh, people in the Arab world that that are uh, in charge of digital transformation, and those could be uh, somehow connected to this to this learning community. And we will also try to connect the person to the Arab uh, technology diaspora here in Germany, for instance. Uh, we have, uh, as as most people know, we had uh, a huge influx of people from the Arab region, and some of them reached very, very remarkable and outstanding positions in, in German companies already. So they can they can also participate in this in this learning process. And it will be at the end of the day, the hope is that it will be an academy for life, right? It will be a lifelong learning path. Uh, because the technology, technological development is so is so quick uh, that uh, it, it needs to be constantly uh, uh, re rewired and re remodeled. There, there is constantly new content coming, and uh, therefore we will seek for a learning path that is hopefully technology augmented. Uh, it has it has physical learning sites. It has a project uh, a labs, project learning sites. Uh, but it will be uh, going on for for as long as the person wants to learn. You mentioned alumni, so kind of digital ambassadors that you'll have in the region for life. This is what you're looking to create for a longer term perspective with the school. Uh, definitely. Mm, and here comes the question, why would Europe, why would governments, why would donors, why would uh, also governments in the region, companies in the region be interested in this, be interested in cooperating on this, as I had explained. Uh, we don't want to reinvent the, the wheel. We want to plug in a lot of the resources that already exist, make good use of them. Uh, and uh, we've been reaching out to a lot of potential cooperation partners also in the region and in Europe in particular. I think there is another dimension to it, why this idea is relevant. And also, to be honest, why I am personally taking such great interest in this idea and uh, enjoy it so much too have been working on this. Um, there is a very, whereas we take great interest in what's happening in the region, we as Europeans, because we see it impacts us, it affects us, uh, and the other way around, of course. Europe and the Arab world are somehow each other's natural zones of influence. And of course, we are moving closer uh, with digitization of the media, but also with the uh, with these, uh, like speedy political geopolitical developments. And um, at the same time, there is very little conversation taking place. You know, the, the conversation that has been going on about civil society, about models, how to build a society, about democracy, about human rights, this has, come, has reached a dead end. There is very little conversation going on, very little uh, of mutual understanding, though this is the region changes. And I think digitization is an ideal entry point to restart the conversation to talk about something practical that concerns us, not lecturing either side and saying, you have to do it the way we, uh, we, we have shown you, um, and uh, being concrete. And I think if we achieve this, and if we can make it happen that people from the region, also from war-torn countries like Yemen and Syria, for example, that I forgot to mention before, shame on me. If people from these countries, and also from mutually uh, hostile countries in the region could sit there and work together on, on this specific topic uh, on their own projects but also like, uh, like collaborate on other projects, I think this can have a great impact uh, in terms of mediation, in terms of peace building mm -hmm. because it produces positive outcomes that everyone can relate to regardless what country you're from, what society you're from or what kind of values uh, have been taught to you. And uh, there's where I see the strongest foreign policy relevance of such a project. Um, it can increase European influence and leverage, but in a very positive sense in the region, because it would be a truly collaborative approach. 
we talk about uh, collaboration all the time, but in, or cooperation a lot of time, but in, in, in fact, it's very often, uh, 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 let's say, it's, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's one direction. Uh, there's a receiver and there is a donor. There's a, a messenger and a receiver of messages. And uh, this doesn't work so well anymore. And we, I think digitization, I might uh, reiterate this, is a great opportunity, a great topic, and a very pressing and urgent topic to, to address these challenges. Maybe adding, adding to that, as we said before, that for some reasons, uh, European countries and Arab countries are on the same level when it comes to the challenges and options of digitization. So we, we, we don't want to implement a kind of post-colonial school model here where we, we, we try to lecture people in the Arab world how digitization can be done. I think Europe is not in the position to do that and Europe doesn't want to do it and shouldn't do it. On the other hand, I would say that the, the model we are looking for is composed of, of learning contents and experiences from the region, trying to combine it with international and regional know-how. And this, this mixture is, is very, very important. And uh, therefore, I think uh, that this is uh, truly a new kind of model. It's, it's, it's not replicating existing uh, Western-dominated uh, kind of schools, but it, it will be a mixture of, of Arab content and, and international content. And uh, it will also make the students to participate as a, as a teacher as well. So we, when we discuss this, this case study issue, for instance, so the, the student that will discuss his, uh, his, uh, his or her project will discuss it also with the, with the other students. And thereby we want to also increase the, the, uh, the discussion among participants in the Arab world, which we have found before to be, to be uh, really limited for, for various reasons. Ines, do you agree that this really can serve as an opportunity to deepen cooperation and also go beyond that perhaps more narrow scope of developing new technology and also touch on societal issues and transformation? I mean, technology is now uh, contributing to solving many issues. Uh, I, I mean, maybe uh, technology is not seen as uh, a priority in the Arab world because we still need to fulfill many basic, uh, other basic needs like, uh, you know, uh, clean water, like, uh, you know, um, uh, infrastructure, roads, uh, name it, jobs. But I think technology can play, uh, you know, the the role of um, bringing solutions and innovators. We have many talent, talented young people who have brilliant ideas that can solve societal issues. Uh, and 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 the the academy can um, and and the German collaboration in a way can also boost and improve the quality of life of, of uh, you know, help uh, contributing into a better quality of life through uh, technology. Um, and um, there are many solutions now, they are tackling um, uh, issues that the governments have failed to, governments and also international agencies, development agencies, they failed to, to tackle issues and, and startups are filling that gap. So I think it's a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, intervention. Yeah, should be. So it sounds like you have the right initiative at the right time. There is demand for it. Daniel, so what is next for this project? Oh, <laughs> that's, that's uh, difficult to answer. What is next in digital transformation? How, to what extent can we predict? Or for uh, your, for your for project. Our, of course, for yeah. our project. Uh, you know, but this is, this is our, our proposal. And we are inviting uh, stakeholders, potential partners to join us in this initiative. Mm -hmm. As I said, this is not a prefabricated uh, take it or leave it. It's in the making, as the entire process is in the making. And whatever uh, is going to materialize out of it, I can also imagine that this, what we call this product that we call Mena DS, uh, will remain in the making. It will be transformative and it will be transforming. Uh, we will learn. Uh, we will learn from 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 the students, uh, from uh, the cooperation partners, and adapt to a rapid, rapidly evolving and rapidly changing uh, context here. And uh, this is what makes this uh, attractive. Probably, sometimes probably also difficult to grasp, um, because as we have to admit, there is many questions that remain unanswered, and we cannot be serious, seriously claiming that we uh, are able to answer them all. But this is a great invitation, an invitation to many people out there to send us their ideas. We have studied the market, we have studied the field, we haven't found any, any, 
initiatives that are uh, designed in the way that we are intending to design this. But uh, of course, uh, you know, there is uh, the di digital space is an open space, and um, uh, the exchange of information is 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 wanted, and uh, this is not competitive. We are not trying to compete with anyone, but we are trying to get as many qualified partners on board as possible. Anything to add to that, Ayad, of what you hope to see next for this project that you've helped create? I think the, uh, although the idea is not, is not uh, fully for formulated yet, as, as it's, it's work in progress, we already see that uh, we have a very good discussion with, with potential partners that, that want to participate, that, that have similar uh, ideas, similar intentions. And I think then it will, it will be in our, in our hands to somehow <laughs> forge those kinds of cooperations. It's not, it's not always easy because we have to adhere to also re regulations and also re requirements from, from, uh, from certain sides. Uh, but I think we will find a way. And the good thing about digitization is that uh, it, it gives us some kind of flexibility. And if you are, uh, if you are ready to, to embark on a kind of unconventional journey, then, then, then this is absolutely fine. As I said before, we don't want to, we don't to build, we're not going to build the next uh, huge university building somewhere, but we want to use content and, and ideas and we want to use the, 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 the flow that is already in the, in the region, the, the, the energy that, that is there, we, we, want to, we want to be part of it. So we have to be flexible and uh, I think this, this can be done. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of it. Maybe we can go around before we, before we go and just say what you see as your biggest hope uh, for the next step in terms of digitization and the partnership between Europe and the MENA region, especially as you embark on this project and this policy proposal that you put together. I have a, f uh, a good friend who is an architect and uh, who taught me a lot about his field of uh, expertise. And once he, he, he explained to me that the way that we design of course, determines the way that we build. The tools, the instruments that we use to design something uh, is, it has basically prejudice on the result. So if we, if, we, if we reinvent or reconsider the tools of, of, of design, then certainly what we are going to build will look very different and, uh, and uh, will inspire us in a different way. Um, I hope that um, those that we can partner with uh, will understand uh, the need to reconsider the design, the design of cooperation, um, and the design to respond or to, 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 to create uh, the adequate responses to the challenges that we have. Um, this is what we can contribute. This is what we, as, as the Candid Foundation, uh, with the support of the Federal Foreign Office, the German Federal Foreign Office, in this project in particular, we're trying to do. And uh, I'm very optimistic to learn from the practical, pragmatic, and optimist approach of my fellow colleagues, economists, techies, startup entrepreneurs, and whatever walks of life they come from. That's a very positive lens to look at, uh, look through rather. Ines? Um, I definitely hope that this idea, um, very brilliant idea, um, um, get uh, enough investments and uh, get implemented uh, very soon because I think it's an uh, urgent matter and uh, we definitely need to build expertise. The expertise is there, the talent is there, like the, the region is boiling with lots of, uh, you know, dynamic ideas, energy of, of innovation, but I think um, um, uh, bilateral um, or multilateral collaboration um, with some investment sh should help um, get these ideas uh, concrete and, and implemented in a, in a very good way. So uh, I, I wish to be involved as well. So that's, uh, yeah. And I, uh... I think uh, what the, the vision I would be having uh, about if everything works well and, and uh, would be a kind of, I don't know, a round table where people from the Arab world and from Europe were sitting and they both discuss the, the, the issues, the options and the strategies they, they want to implement in their home countries. And during the discussion they will find out 
that there are very similar, uh, similar issues and they will find out that there are very similar strategies to those issues. And, uh, they will, and, and Western people will find out that there are things to, to learn from, from the Arab world and Arab people will find out there are, uh, there are strategies that, that uh, they can reimagine in their, in their context. So it will be a learning process for, for both sides. And I think uh, uh, this, this could be done uh, because I, I, I absolutely believe in uh, that we do face very similar uh, challenges and we also have very similar options despite, despite the uh, different context that the, the countries are in. So, so this would be my, my uh, positive imagination. This, this is what would uh, keep me working on this. So a mutually beneficial collaboration. Absolutely. Otherwise it will not, it will not work. It cannot be imposed. Uh, it, it must be wanted from, from both sides. I think it's a very positive outlook and uh, we'll have to leave it at that because we're running out of time. But thank you for the very interesting discussion, Ines, Ayed and Daniel. And of course, to find out more about the MENA Digital School, do look at the report and reach out to the Candid Foundation. Thank you for the discussion. <laughs>